And one of the things we got to demand is on time, since we always want, time is precious down here. That's why uh, we have the word futures in our name, is that uh, we, we, we can only do so much in the future. So up here on the uh, board, which I put up, it says happy, thank, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. I hope all you were, I see a few people that are sparkling with uh, green, but, uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, it, uh, I've asked everybody to sign in if they have a business card to put them in. Or could you go around and pass this back? And um, hope everybody signed in and picked up an agenda um, when they signed in, which was up here at the table. And the first thing we do on the uh, agenda is an introduction, so that helps me figure out which, um, uh, which speaker is already here or not. And so. Um, uh, again, my name is Michael Nolte. I'm the, uh, one of the uh, administrators of Ten Life Futures Collaborative. And um, if you have information you want to know about the, the group, it's on the back page of the agenda, more details. Over to the right here, John Nolte. Marjorie Begg, Central City Extra. Hi, I'm Denise Dory, a uh, progressive TV producer trying to take it back our city. And we're going to do it. Katie Lamont. I Betty Trainer, Friends of Bodecker Park. Oh, I'm Bradley Dunn. I'm the new District 6 liaison for the SFMTA. And I'm Kelly Ehrenfeld with the Northern California Community Loan Fund and City Contractor. Thank you. Could you say that again? I'm the Northern California Community Loan Fund and City Contractor. Oh, okay. We okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brittany Hopkins. I write for the Minnesota Fund. Thank you. Uh, Susan, introduce yourself. Susan. Oh, I'm Susan Bryan. I'm the treasurer of district of uh, the, Alliance. the Alliance for Better District Six, and, an and I'm a resident. I live across the street. And you're administrator of Tessie. Yeah. <laughs> so how is it related to this? Okay. All right, great. Uh, so we try to start on time. Um, I noticed that our first agenda item, which is uh, number two, is not here yet. So uh, we're going to move on to the next one, uh, which uh, puts uh, Katie. Uh, Katie's here, right? Yes. Yeah. So could you just stand in the middle sure. somewhere and uh, look intelligent with the cameras, <laughs> that is. Okay. Over here? I don't yeah, well, ask them where they're going to be. Okay. Um, so thank you all for the opportunity to come and provide. Um, I, was, I was asked to provide an update on TNDC developments here in the neighborhood. And as you know, we've been here a long time. We own a number of properties, and we have a number of um, projects in development right now that I wanted to give you an update about. So. Uh, the first one is Eddie and Taylor, which I uh, know at least one member of the audience is very interested in, that does not love the design. Um, however, we are proceeding with that development. It includes 113 units of family housing, and we have now secured all of our financing and are moving forward towards a construction start that is projected for sometime between April and of next year. Um, there is a parking lot at the site, and we will be working with that parking lot operator to relocate to another location. Um, another subject that might be of interest to this group, um, TBC's original vision for that site was to include a ground floor grocery store. We were hoping for something like a Safeway. Um, we had to downsize the development, and we have about 5,000 or 5,500 square feet of retail now. So we are still looking to provide some kind of healthy food um, related use in that space, and we are working with a food consultant um, and a work group to help us define our ideal uses for that space and reach out to those users. So I think certainly from this audience here now or in the future, if you guys have any thoughts or recommendations around that, we, the, we'll be most welcome, and now is a good time for us to be receiving input. I have a question. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, what happened to the original plan that the space would be large enough to accommodate a large store, which we desperately need? What happened? Well, there were two challenges. One is that um, we were able to accommodate about 12,000 square feet on the first level. 
given the soil, we couldn't put parking below grade. It, does, so it would be really prohibitive because of the condition of the soil. And then putting parking above um, would have taken out a unit of housing is also quite expensive. So we ran into challenges with like a, a Safeway or traditional grocery store. That footprint was fairly small for a store and then no parking is like something they can't really get their minds around. No, I, I understand. I happened to be at an OCI commission meeting the other day where I heard something interesting. It's not um, a done deal, but apparently Trader Joe's is looking at a site on 4th or 5th between Market and Mission, which I think could be great for the neighborhood. I don't think it's anywhere near a done deal, though. Yeah. Um, and apparently Whole Foods is thinking about coming into that new um, development that's on market, which, you know, that's a high price point. So I don't know how helpful that is ultimately to the neighborhood. Yeah, but now I understand about your challenges, the soil and the Right, right. So we are, we have been working with the corner stores to try to, us and DPH and a broad coalition, probably folks in this room are part of that, to try to work with the businesses who are already here to encourage them to have healthier offerings. And so we're looking to somehow expand on that and bring some kind of healthy, affordable food use to Eddie and Taylor. Yes. Has anyone consulted with Rainbow Grocery? They, there are several there are several stores of that type. One is Other Avenues out on 40, I think 40, 43rd, 44th, 45th Avenue in Judah. Okay. Other Avenues, Rainbow Grocery. They, these are, um, uh, these are, uh, have, are on the model of a collective or, um, uh, you know, so would the, they, it would be a, a way that people who in the neighborhood could be working. Right, like a worker. It's yeah, a worker, -owned, worker owned. Yeah, we're a cooperative, collective, right. that kind of that kind of structure. Yes, I appreciate the suggestion. I know that we we did a lot of research, and I know we reached out to Rainbow back in like 2007 or 2008 when we were first doing this work, and now we're restarting that. So I will bring that suggestion to the work mm -hmm. group. Yes. So how many uh, low-income disabled people are they are allowed to live there if they have an income of, say, $12,000 a year out of 300 units you have there? How many, uh, and also, uh, um, because this, had, this tenderloin has the highest density of disabled people, and to bring in just families is going to displace a lot of people because the rents are going to go up, 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 up. So because we've got, a, San Francisco has a huge okay, amount of the space. First question, that was for better answer, first question. So Eddie and Taylor will have 113 units, to be clear, about 113. Um, it will serve families in a range of unit sizes from studios, one, twos, and three bedroom apartments. 30 of the units are gonna serve formerly homeless families who are gonna be referred through the human services agencies. Those families may or may not have a member with a disability, but if they earn 12,000 a year, they will be they will be able to afford to live there because the city provides an operating subsidy to cover the difference between what they can pay in rent and the cost to operate the building. In addition to those 30, we will have five additional units um, that will be targeted for <coughs> households where an adult member is living with a developmental disability or is exiting a long-term care institution. So. Um, trying to address some issues where some people are institutionalized or staying in hospitals because there's nowhere for them to exit to. Um, so then the balance of the units, which is about 65, 78 units, are going to have a scheduled rent. So there will be residents who live there will need to have a minimum income, and those rents um, are, are targeted to a, a family, a rent, like if a family of four would have to have an income of about $50,000 a year to qualify, that would be the upper limit. And so they would probably need to earn at least 30 or 35 in order to be able to afford to pay the rent. So we're actually shutting disabled people out. That's basically it. Okay, thank you. Well, I just, on the um, grocery store, uh, I don't remember the name, but in the Mission District, it's either on the corner of 19th or 18th in Mission. Yeah, Doug Lloyd. Lloyd. Yeah, I don't, sorry. yeah, that's another one that has come to our attention, and I know one of our, you know, another nonprofit, Mission Housing, has some relationships with the folks at that grocery. I think it's a good suggestion, and that's an example of a grocery that serves, you know, they have food that serves, you know, is, is demanded by a variety of different ethnicities. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, folks who don't identify as being particularly ethnic also shop there. So I think it's a good example. Oh, it was, too. Yeah. Meta, what's Mission Economic Development, they may be connected, too, and they may be able to help them Meta. if they're interested. Uh, yes. They're almost across the street or a block away. And they, uh, that's one of the things they do, is to help small right, businesses. Right, those, you know. right, right. Yeah. What's yeah. the name of the organization? It's called Duck Loy, D-U-C-L-O-I. So um, I actually have to be, uh, I actually am on the food, whatever it's called, or the correct name of this <laughs> committee. And we're kind of rehashing some of the issues that keep on coming up. Right. First of all, the, the, as far as I can understand, is that uh, there was like 40 uh, stores that were contacted. But the problem here is uh, Safeway, and I, I wish you wouldn't keep on saying Safeway because Safeway is not a, a neighborhood serving uh, business. Uh, Calo was more neighborhood serving because it gave coupons and, and so forth, and it, it shut down eventually the two sites. Uh, uh, when Bristol Farms tried to move into the neighborhood, we specifically tried to get senior discounts. They provided not, and they didn't get their liquor, their liquor license. So there is ways that the community can try to put pressure, which this neighborhood doesn't seem to do correctly in a good fashion, to put pressure on new uh, businesses coming in uh, that could serve for groceries. <coughs> but you can't change the model of some of these existing um, um, corporations, and that's what they are. Right. So Susan's <coughs> correct. The North American Planning Coalition, many years now, has talked about the co-ops. Mm -hmm. We do not want to see. Uh, Safeway, we do not want to see because they're taking the money out of the neighborhood and they're not going to give back. Right, right. And, uh, so you, you keep on saying Safeway, it, it turns my stomach when I hear that. Right. It's just like saying we're going to add another Walgreens into the neighborhood. That is not mm -hmm. what we need. We don't need big corporations coming in and not caring about the neighborhood and taking from the neighborhood uh, our disposable income and not returning it. So at least um, small businesses, you should be asking the existing small business owners that already have a base in the neighborhood, uh, what do they see a vision for the neighborhood? Um, and you keep on saying we don't have a large grocery store when in fact we do. Our largest grocery store is Cooked Up Market. I mean, we have existing ones mm -hmm. and we should be pointing those out and try to get people and finding subsidies or heavy subsidies for the ones that exist um, so people can have access to what's already here, mm -hmm. and uh, if you can't get other, other models to happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I want, I'm listening to this all the time, but the thing is, let's get to what there is instead of what there isn't. Mm -hmm. You can spend out, you know, days and days mm -hmm. and days talking about the, what there isn't, but let's deal with what there is, and how can we make uh, what's here? I mean, for example, we know that uh, anything you put into the... Uh, um, this location is going to request a liquor license. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that this is a special use district, so that would mean that one of the existing stores is going to have to go mm -hmm. uh, to get the liquor license. So let's look at the realities here. Mm -hmm. So maybe asking one of the current store owners that already have a liquor license or has, has operation or get a co-op of the uh, existing um, uh, store owners who know how to operate a store, not saying they're all great partners, but right. to get them to get them to the table and get their ideas. Uh, because you're asking uh, the wrong group of people that are not in the business to start a business. <laughs> I mean, the, the community is not in the business of selling groceries, uh, it, whereas the, the business owners are. Right. And they have to deal with the, uh, they have their connections and they have their uh, retail <coughs> outlets and all, all the things that they have to do to stay in business. And one of the big things down here is, um, most, most store owners get their money off of alcohol or cigarettes. And a lot of people don't like either one uh, in the community, but that's, you have to be real about how is a business going to survive and, uh, and then pay the minimum wage and, uh, unless you're uh, an owner of the, or co-owner of the co-op. Um, there has to be a kind of a character of getting people involved. Um, so um, that's kind of my two cents. As, they're right now in the room uh, four, three uh, uh, former board members of the North American Planning Coalition, mm -hmm. and we've been addressing this concern for many years. Right. Uh, it's just that some certain entities come along and, and want to take, take, say, well, this is our, our role, but the problem here is it's already been spelled out in the uh, 10 like 2000, mm -hmm. uh, this issue, and of course it's been an issue since then, uh, 10 like 2000. All right. Um, so uh, since it's more about the development than the uh, grocery store, so uh, 
Huh? Yes. Yeah. Project. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your offering that context. Um, oh, and there's, there's also the Lafayette Diner closed. They need somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They need somewhere. Okay. Yeah, that's another need is a really low income restaurant. Right. We've been trying to replace Maria's. The, the, no, Manor which is the Manor House restaurant. Right, which was in the Antonia Manor. And um, we identified a provider. There's been some challenges with the build out there. Um, but yes, thank you for reminding me of that. <clears throat> so thank you for all these comments. I definitely hear your comments about working with the existing community of businesses. <clears throat> um, so the next two um, developments I wanted to speak about are um, I was here maybe a year ago, a couple months ago, and I know I believe you also had a city speaker come in and speak with you about this, this city's big citywide effort to rehabilitate um, public housing and particularly the senior and disabled buildings. And TNDC is working to rehabilitate five senior and disabled buildings, and two of them are here in the Tenderloin. So the first one is 430 Turk which is currently under construction. So we took ownership of the building last November. The Housing Authority is retaining ownership of the land. And um, that's about 89 units, and um, it's construction's underway. It should be completed at the end of this year. So <clears throat> something important that I wanna make sure you all know is that for both this building and the other one, 350 Ellis, which is just up the street here on Ellis, it's two doors down from Glide's Church. Um, the residents living in the buildings will need to relocate temporarily for a couple weeks at a time to accommodate renovation of their units and also work that is doing to strengthen the, the seismic performance of the buildings as well as make accessibility improvements. But everyone has the right to return and we've um, designed the program to minimize the disruption in people's lives. So most people are gonna be relocating within the building, um, and a couple people will be going off-site, and we've worked with people to, um, as much as possible, take volunteers to do the off-site moves. Um, 350 Ellis is 96. Could you, first that one, could you tell how long it's gonna take for the rehab? Yes, so for 430 Turk, we started construction last November, <clears throat> and we plan to complete no later than this December. So those um, units will be completely renovated, and whatever, <clears throat> vacancies are there will be filled by the end of this year. I have a couple of questions. No, 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 no. I have questions. Now, uh, I was in, I've been in the building 430 Turk. It, it used to be a precinct for, for election. Are you going to be maintaining the, the space uh, that was open there for the community rooms? Is that going to be still community rooms or are you going to change it into uh, units? It will remain a community room. So I'm glad you mentioned this. So 430 Turk is actually a, a structure that has the first two levels um, is the entry for the apartments on the ground floor and then the balance of the first floor and all of the second floor was administrative offices for the housing authority. On the ground floor, they also um, had a commission room which they let the, the building and other members of the community use. So the plan now is the building was actually condominiumized, so TNDC owns the residential portion and the ground floor residential entry portion, and the housing authority has retained the office portion, and they may move their headquarters back to there. That's not finally determined, but they that's their current plan. They want to keep that option open. So in the, in the um, design of the rehab, there was a lot of negotiation around the ground floor space, and um, it was recognized that it was important to maintain the tenant's historic ability to use the commission room as a community space. So there is, <clears throat> the area associated with the housing has been expanded to include a community room just for the housing that no one has to borrow from the housing authority and to have more offices for more staff. So we will have a more significant management presence and resident services presence um, with TNC owning and operating the building that was, was there with um, the housing authority. We are, um, we are now providing property management, TDC itself. The tenant services were being provided by Northern California Presbyterian Homes and Services, and we chose to keep that service provider in place. So TDC does provide tenant services, and our 
usual preference is to provide management and services, but in this case, we, we decided to work with the existing tenant service provider because 